How to Build a Home Gym Not everybody who wants to train for strength can fit a gym membership into their lifestyle. Scheduling problems, the cost, travel problems from home or work, the absence of an adequately equipped facility in the market, or simply the dislike of a commercial gym environment motivates many people to invest in a home gym. A serviceable home gym for barbell training need not be a gigantic investment, and in fact, it should be very simple. A bar, some plates, a rack of some type to facilitate the squat and the pressing exercises, a simple flat bench for the bench press, and a platform for deadlifts is all that is absolutely required. For power cleans and snatches, a few bumper plates are quite useful, but not absolutely necessary. The equipment is simple and need not be expensive. But here are a few tricks. The bar. Friends, this is the wrong place to save money. Of all the pieces in the gym, the quality of the bar is the most critical. The plates just hang there. The platform just lays there, but the bar is your connection to the force against which you will lift, gravity. Saving money is a good idea. Generic drugs are cheaper than the name brand products, and they are essentially the same product. But this is not true of Olympic barbells. In most cases, you get exactly what you pay for. Unless you get lucky, and these days of rapid expansion in the interest in barbell training, such luck is hard to come by. You get lucky and find a good cheap used bar, you'll need to expect to pay around $300 for a good bar. Why? Well, because steel is expensive. Competent manufacturing is expensive. And warehouse space costs money. A cheap bar will bend. And a badly bent bar is junk, scrap metal. A bar with, oh, three millimeter or so, within three millimeter or so perfectly straight is usable as a straight bar, while a bar bent more than four to five millimeters out of straight is considered bent. When loaded with plates, a badly bent bar will rotate to a position of stability. It will right itself so to speak, with the ends of the bar pointing down and the bend in the middle pointing up. Now, this is fine for the squat if you have marked the bar so you can take it out of the rack in this stable position. But if you unrack the bar for a squat, press, or bench press, or pull it from the floor in its unstable configuration, the middle pointed down, for example, the bar will spin in your hands or on your back to right itself. This is not good and can cause profound safety problems during the lift. Most commercial gyms have a few bars, and usually, most of the time, all of them are bent because they bought cheap, junky bars, not knowing any better or not caring about it. Bars get bent in commercial gyms by being dropped on benches or inside the rack by jackasses that aren't invested in the equipment. Even expensive bars will bend when 315 is dropped across a bench. But cheap bars will bend if they're left loaded in the rack overnight. You could check a bar for straightness by placing it on the floor and spinning it in the middle with your foot, that's if the sleeves aren't frozen, which is also a bad thing to have happen to your bar. If it wobbles visibly at all, it is not straight. Or you can see the wobble when you rotate it in the rack. The end of the bar will describe a circle in the air larger than the diameter of the sleeve, if you can visualize what I'm saying here and the middle of the bar will move back and forth, the greatest deviation being at the point of the bend. One of the advantages of a home gym is that you get to work with a straight bar every time you train. 
Bars are available in several diameters. The Olympic Weightlifting Federations specify a 28 millimeter bar, while the International Powerlifting Federation wants the diameter to be between 28 and 29 millimeters. The standard bar length is a little over seven feet, about seven foot three inches, has a two inch 50 millimeter diameter sleeve on each end for loading the plates, and it weighs 20 kilos, or 44.1 pounds. The thicker the bar, the stiffer the bar. So Olympic lifters doing the faster snatch and clean and jerk like the whippiness of a 28 millimeter bar, and power lifters need a stiffer bar because they handle heavier weights more slowly. Olympic lifting uses a 25 millimeter bar for the women's division because smaller hands need a smaller bar, and a competitive lifter will need one of these. For home gym purposes, a 28 and a half or 29 millimeter bar will be the most durable and provide the best service over time. Never buy a 32 millimeter bar. They are either junk or a specialty squat bar that a home gym just does not need. Usually they're junk, scrap metal, pot metal, melted down rebar, real estate signs. Do not buy a 32 millimeter bar. Plates. Now let's talk about plates. Plates just hang there, right? They're made of cast iron and they add mass to the bar. They don't have to be new because new cast iron and old cast iron both weigh the same. All you care about is what they weigh and how well they fit the sleeve of your bar. So if you can find used plates, buy them. They're scarce these days, but you occasionally run into them at garage sales and used sporting goods stores. Used name brand plates may cost 50 cents to a dollar a pound these days, while the new ones may be twice that much. Add shipping to the calculation and you'll see why you need to look harder for used plates. Junky plates are sometimes cast with the hole in the middle too big for the bar sleeve. A plate with an inside diameter of 52 millimeters or more will be sloppy on the 50 millimeter sleeve of the barbell. This won't matter much unless the bar is loaded on the floor for the deadlift when the bar rests on the bottom of the inside diameter of the plates instead of the plates hanging from the top of the outside diameter of the sleeve. Sloppy plates on the floor will lean to one side when loaded and will have to be collared tightly in place to keep them from becoming a disorganized mess in between reps. But even for the squat, sloppy plates that wiggle on the bar as you step back can be very distracting and will always have to be collared to keep them still. The best plates are calibrated to the precise weight on the face of the plate. They are expensive. Junky plates can weigh damn near anything. I have face value 45s at my gym that weigh between 41.75 pounds and 56 pounds. I have seen 59 and a half pound 45 pound plates. As long as you know what the bar weighs when it's loaded and are able to balance each side with the same weights, uneven plates are fine. But accurately cast or milled to weight castings are much easier to train with, really. Depending on how strong you are or how strong you intend to get, you'll need in pounds, these values will be in pounds, two to six pairs of 45 pound plates. The smaller plates are critical to make the training math work. You have to be able to load the bar to precise weights, the same weight every time, and in increments small enough to accommodate the exercises that don't get strong very fast. So you'll need one pair of 25s, two pairs of 10s, one pair of fives, 
one pair of two and a halfs and a set of micro plates that allow the loading of increments smaller than five pounds. You probably will not find used micro plates and they can be expensive as a new set, but they can be made from stacks of two inch flat washers if your hardware store happens to have those in stock. Bumper plates are a different matter. If you're going to do snatches and cleans, it's much more convenient to use rubber bumper plates. In antiquity, we just caught the bar after the lift was completed and set it down on the platform. Unless we were at a meet where the platform was the meet director's problem, not ours. Now, rubber plates allow the bar to be dropped to the ground without too much damage to either the floor or the bar and plates. But this has changed the nature of the lifts. Since you don't have to lower the lift under control, about half the work of the lift is actually gone. But bumper plates are the way it's done now, and they do, in fact, save a lot of wear and tear on the bar and the platform. They're always expensive, even when you can find them used. And getting them used is very hard to do these days. You'll probably end up buying them new, but the good news is that you will only need three pairs. A pair of 22 pounds, 10 kilos. Bumpers are usually made in kilos for the Olympic weightlifting market, but pound denominations are also available. And they're marked in both pounds and kilos. So you need a pair of 10 kilos, a pair of 15 kilos, which are 33, and a pair of 20 kilos, which are 44 pounds. You'll find the tens useful for warming up the deadlift if you're not very strong yet, since they are the same diameter, 45 centimeters, as your iron 45s in the other room. So the bar is the same distance off the ground, but it only weighs 88 pounds. If you don't intend to do the Olympic lifts, just get a pair of tens so you can load a lighter weight on the floor. Squats, presses, and bench presses must be taken out of a rack of some sort, the purpose of which is to keep you from having to wrestle the bar into position from the floor, a process which is both dangerous and limiting to the weight you can lift that way, as you might imagine. The rack provides a way to load the bar off the ground at an adjustable height by providing a hook on either side of the bar to hold the weight up. Racks come in several different configurations, from a pair of simple individual stands to a garage filling beast designed for a well-endowed university's varsity weightlifting program. Individual stands are dangerously unstable for an inexperienced trainee and are a bad accident waiting to happen if you use them for the bench press. A better choice is the portable squat rack, which looks like two stands tied together at the bottom. It's adjustable for both height of the bar and the width between the hooks, and it's much more stable than individual stands. But the best option by far is the power rack, sometimes called a cage, a system of four to six perforated upright supports that permit the bar to be positioned both inside and outside the uprights at a variety of heights. A good rack has a floor that is integral to the frame with a cross member under the middle of the floor and a heavy plywood surface to stand on. A welded rack may be sturdier than one bolted together, but a bolted rack is much easier and cheaper to ship and install. A good rack, a flat bench, and a platform provide a way to safely perform all the barbell exercises alone in your home gym. By setting the cross pins inside the rack just under the range of motion for the squat or the bench press, they eliminate the need for a spotter. The defining limitation of training at home by yourself. A very good power rack will cost $1,200. But they are findable in the used market and they are quite often cheaper than that. So look there first. In my opinion, the best racks are made from C-channel, but square tubing is much more commonly used for the uprights 
in most commercial racks. A power rack should be provided with both cross pins and hooks so that the bar can be placed either inside or outside the rack, depending on the lift and the spotter situation. If you're going to bench press, you have to lay down on something to do it. A flat bench is the device we use to do supine loaded movements with a barbell in the rack. Your flat bench should be a simple one-piece unit that is hell for stout, yet still light enough to move around the garage when you're not benching in the rack. And the power rack makes the heavy, expensive, upright support version used for powerlifting competitions completely unnecessary. The standard dimensions of a flat bench are 12 inches wide, 48 inches long, and 17 inches high at the top of the surface of the bench. That's all there is to a flat bench. Buy one in these dimensions because taller, shorter, longer, narrower, wider benches have proven to be less useful than the standard design dimensions I have, quote, I have quoted here. It should be made from tubing or angle iron and have a lengthwise brace under the top and another one halfway down the legs. It should have feet as wide as the top and use a solid 2 by 12 for the surface. Metal tops are sometimes used, but they add unnecessarily to the weight, and a solid 2 by 12 piece of good lumber is stout enough to handle world record weights and has for decades. It will therefore be just fine for you. Mine are covered with automobile upholstery fabric because it lasts about 15 times longer than vinyl, and it is not slippery against your back under any conditions. The platform is a useful item that keeps you from destroying your floor. Its size will depend on how much room you have, but the biggest one you can build will be the most useful to you, giving you plenty of room to work in front of your rack. Build it from 4x8 sheets of plywood or 4x8 sheets of medium density fiberboard, MDF. At six pieces, which would be three layers, each layer turned at 90 degrees makes a nice square platform. Now, a little note, MDF is available only in 49 by 97 dimensions. And if you overlap those at 90 degrees, you will have to trim one inch from the end and the side of each one of the boards. The platform, when finished, must be flush with the floor of your rack when pulled up against the wood. So the height of the rack floor will determine the combined thicknesses of the plywood that composes the platform. The platform rack floor surface, again, must be flush or you will have a significant trip hazard. So measure this carefully. Many people cover both the rack floor and the platform with horse trailer mat rubber to protect the wood and to provide a non-slip surface. Some cutting of the rubber will be necessary since it only comes in four by eight sheets. So you'll need to use a utility knife and, and perhaps some spray soap to make the cuts, which will save you time and aggravation. A platform laid on a concrete floor will require flipping from time to time depending on the humidity in your area. The underside absorbs moisture and swells why the top dries out so the surface will dish eventually to the extent that the platform wobbles when you step on the edges. The rubber may mitigate this effect and may be worth installing for that reason. If the platform must be flipped, make sure you build it with deck screws driven in from both surfaces so that it holds together during the movement. Flipping takes at least two people 
So schedule it with your friends. And since you're going to ask the best equipment companies to deal with for bars, plates, bumpers, racks, and benches are Rogue Fitness at roguefitness.com and Elite Fitness Systems at elitefts.com. In an industry famous for bad to terrible customer service, these guys will take care of you, and I don't buy from anyone else. Now, my custom-designed power rack is made by Brown Brothers Welding here in Wichita Falls, Texas. I am not in the equipment business, and I make no money whatsoever from equipment sales. None. So when I tell you these guys are good, you can believe it. I am not being paid. For an investment of at most $2,500, which is like five years gym dues or less, and probably much cheaper than that, you can build a perfectly serviceable, world-class facility in your 500-square-foot garage at home. You can train whenever you want to with equipment whose quality and maintenance you alone control. For many people, this means the difference between a focused, convenient workout and the aggravation of having to deal with fools, shitty equipment, and travel time. Invest wisely, and you'll never regret owning good equipment or the independence made possible by owning your own gym. 